it's like a dream of mine to to sure. completely blow out and like have to restructure my knee. We've communicated yeah. and said, you know what? Lion tastes good. Let's go get some more lion. Cindy! The TV's leaking! McLovin? Yeah. Today is Thomas Cup's birthday, and this is Project X. Yo. Hello, you are listening or watching or streaming um, Birdcore. <clears throat> I'm your host, Sam Bird. I'm here with my producer, Kit. Kit, how are you, sweetheart? I'm doing great, Sam. Absolutely fantastic. Love that. I love that. I'm just adjusting my levels here. Can you can you hear me okay in the headphones? If I hope the audience can hear me okay. Send me a text if you can, if you have my phone number. Or hit my line on Instagram at Sam Bird Ewell or at Birdcore Show. Uh, we have a guest today. I uh, I have to admit this was uh, this was an emergency guest last minute situation guest. We were lucky to be uh, using the bathroom at the same time yesterday at school, and I said, "Hey, first of all, great stream. Second of all, um, do you want to come on uh, Birdcore tomorrow? I need a guest." And my friend that I am uh, that I that we are joined with by today is uh, none other than a writer director in my improv class as well THA340 shout out Gary what's his last name West man West, West. Yeah, come Gary on West. that's so yeah. disrespectful I'm sorry I'm sorry he also did stand up at the age of 16 which I find very impressive uh, ladies and gentlemen Kirby Sloan now you'd find it impressive unless you heard the jokes I was telling then it would probably be less impressive. And also, I like how you start the show by basically saying that I was just a last-minute sub. It's like, you know what? We tried everybody else. I tried literally everyone I know, and it's only because I had a bigger horn than him that I was like, I feel comfortable bringing him on the show. Yeah, yeah. Which is fair. You do have a nice shaft, I will admit. Appreciate that, Very man. nice. Thank you for, thank you for, you really mean it, bro? Yeah, I mean, you do low ride a lot a when bit. you pee. Yeah. Like, you're one of those kids that drops it to the ankles, but mm -hmm. I admire that about you. That's confidence. Thank you, man. You know? It took a lot. It took time. It took patience, but we're here. Ten seconds into the show, and I've already started talking. Yeah, a and we're going to wrap up here. <laughs> <laughs> Kirby, thanks for being here, man. Have you been uh, in this studio before? Every time I have a guest in here, I remind them of how hot this studio is. I was going to say, I, I'm very hot right now. Yeah. And this is my first time in here, and I wish I knew, because I, I dressed up for you. I don't know if the cameras can see, but I'm wearing the exact same pants I wore yesterday. Yeah. And there are some seriously heavy pants. And so my butt sweat is going to be right. off the charts. That's okay. you got to embrace it. Yeah, and they're roots pants, so they must be comfortable heavy pants, right? They're very comfortable. Okay. I will admit, they're very comfortable, and Good. they they do block the butt sweat. You don't notice it. Uh, that's know? always a big fear of mine. When I'm wearing like gray sweatpants and I'm like sitting in a lecture for three hours, yeah, and I stand up, I'm like, sh like, should I get someone to check? Like, is it dark gray now? I'm always yeah. scared about that, but usually it's fine. See, I can't wear khakis anymore. I was golfing in khakis with my buddies, and it was like a pool back there. But oh my God. but this is mostly my fault. Uh, I did shave my butt in high school, and uh, the sweat has never been the same since. That's not a joke. It has seriously been a problem. You. Like I cannot wear khakis anymore. There are very specific types I have to wear. Oh, wow. And like exclusively dry fit underwear. As well. Oh, absolutely. Just yeah, to like, yeah, yeah. yeah make sure. Yeah. You know? I'm sure this is not how you thought this episode would start by me just admitting I shaved my butt. But <laughs> I, well, you know what? I thought about that. No, I didn't have any, I didn't have anything in mind of, of how it would start. Um, I was just going to kind of go with the flow. And that's good um, to hear. Yeah. My dad texted me. My dad texts me. He listens to every episode and I always kind of rely on him in the first few minutes to, to let me know if it's running smoothly or not. So he texted me and said the stream has uh frozen but that's his it's i don't think it really has that does this happens. have to do with the stream we were talking about to start the show like your stream yesterday different or the stream. the stream for this episode different okay stream, different okay, stream okay, for the I got episode. You. yeah for sure i'm sure he'll be just fine um so i'm gonna remember that next time i see you in khakis then if i ever see you in khakis probably not really? no probably not i actually wore them to improv one time and oh, i okay. left a bit of a, a mark and one of the kids in the class was like why is this seat wet and i was standing at the back of the class like i i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> why yeah, is this seat, seat wet that seat is wet who yeah, did I was like, that what? this what? is so weird it was like that when i sat down in it and now <laughs> guys know, who did this somebody yeah, did someone see? spill their water like, like look at the what? repercussions of my actions yeah. and also don't do it because if you do it to the woodwork this is a tmi 
side, but it kind of grows in like your facial hair, so it gets really itchy, like rubs between. Oh, you know, yeah, wouldn't recommend it. You kind of walk very weird. Good God, this is no, this okay. No, this is not how I mentioned how I anticipated the the episode starting. No, yeah. no, not it's at good. all. No, but, it's it's. You know. I think it's loosened us up a little bit. So, I like what you did there. Yeah, yeah I, I like what I you didn't did do there. anything. I yeah. didn't do no, anything. You no, just I saw what it. you did there. No, I yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't fine. do anything. That's fine. No. Oh man. So you, Kirby, you. I know you from my improv class. So right off the bat, I know that there is some. You uh, there's some performer kind of aspect to you a little bit. I mean, I could see in the class. You're pretty gifted. You uh, you you get the whole class. Uh, cackling um most of the Says time you man come on hey hey we don't come here yourself short here no we don't come here of course up, man okay we'll keep going then you got we'll... a killer british accent <clears throat> well now you're gonna make me to do it i would love for you to do it actually i'd love for you to do it i, I feel like when i do uh, a bit of a british accent sometimes it turns into more like an australian accent like it is right now i was gonna say I think it sounds a lot better when there's not a microphone recording because when you hear it like in really good audio, it does not sound as good. No, it was a lot better in person. Yeah, it, I shouldn't thanks, have man. outed you like that. I apologize. That's okay. That was my bad. But you were talking about me being a performer. I actually have no interest in acting at all. Funny enough. So yeah, like your interest does it lie more in writing? Like you, yeah. t- you tell me a lot about writing, and then you're also a director. Like, is that where? your main focus is yeah 100 percent. i actually took the improv class because i wanted to understand actors better just as like a director i was like you know i gotta understand what they're going through because there are a lot of directors that can be you know not great with actors and i kind of prioritize acting over anything else like when i directed my movie i was always in the room with the actors i wasn't really by the monitor but it's cool because now i'm thinking of okay this is the stuff i have to talk to them about like Mm -hmm. what they look for mannerisms everything so i know how to communicate better and it's not even like directing to be like all right your character talks like this, walks like this, does this, does this. It's more of a conversation. I now realize you kind of got to work that out with an actor. Be like, okay, how do you think yeah. they act? What's their tics? And so this improv class has really helped with that. And it's also shown me that, like, I'm a one-note actor. I was I was telling my buddy, I'm like, you can play characters. I just play myself. Right. That's it. And so I don't want to, like, venture into acting. And then directing I just do for ego because I'm like, I don't trust anybody with my writing. They're going to mess it up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, I feel like that's why you see some... You see some writers who often do direct their own stuff. So you look at Adam McKay. You look at sometimes Danny McBride, but I know Jody Hill does a lot of the directing for the stuff. Well, they kind of write it together. Mm-hmm. Um, Elizabeth Banks as well. Like those are comedy writers and directors. So, are you open to like working with different directors on work that you write, or do you really need to have that full control? No, no, 100%. Because I love the writing more than I love the directing, to be honest. And there's sometimes, like, if I'm really connected to a story, then I think I have to direct it. But I love the writing so much that I would just write a script. And if there's someone I trust, I'd be like, yeah, 100%, do this. Like, this is great. And sometimes I know it won't be for me and there's a better skill set. But if I feel connected to the actual writing, like, a lot more so than 100%. But I just love the writing that if someone was like, hey, you know, you want to write something for me or I got this idea. Mm-hmm. What do you think? A hundred percent. Cause I just would love to write. And then especially working with people that are brilliant in a sense, like I would definitely trust them to see what they do. Cause it's yeah. interesting, but there are going to be some stories for sure. That I'm like, okay, this has to be me. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Where it's like your voice, you have to be the one. Exactly. Um, so when did that kind of start? When did writing, how old are you? I'm 20. You're 20. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm not sure. At least 28. 28 no I like 22 no you don't know no. 22 I was gonna 22. say I can't even grow facial hair yeah I was gonna say like, are you doing November you know what again to talk about funny I did it last year the problem is my hair grows in so blonde I have to yeah. dye my mustache and so I'm like constantly I was constantly dying it last year and then I was like okay no. is it really worth no me dude. dying my facial hair just to have like the worst mustache you've ever seen do you have so a I picture of it no, because it still wasn't visible on camera. Oh, man. <laughs> It'd be like one of those things where people like, I could talk to them for five minutes and they'd go, wait a second, do you have a mustache? And I'd be like, yes. I'd be like, We've been yes. sitting at this table yeah. for an hour. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, yeah. I guess you just noticed now, good to know. And then I have to explain to them I died and they go, well, you should have probably died a little bit darker. Yeah. And then that's why this year I was like, you know what? I love men's mental health, but yeah. I don't don't need to be dying my facial hair all the time. Fair enough. Right? Versus yeah. you, you have a great mustache. Thank you. I'm doing my first Movember right now. Can you do the handlebars? Uh, I could do like, 
No, I don't know about handlebars. Like, no, not really. I have to mention, though, yesterday you had a bit of a, a I had, soul patch yeah. going, and you got rid of it. I got rid of it. I literally, I was texting Kit earlier in the day, and I was at work. I was at the office, and usually I go from the office at 5 o'clock. I walk down to school for class at 6. I texted Kit at, like, 3 o'clock, 3.30. I was like, man, I think the soul patch needs to go. And he was like, yeah, soul patch, like, it doesn't work. And I was, I'm very, very, um, uh, like, impatient and impulsive so i was like i might leave early to go home and shave the soul patch before class but that's just not that's stupid like just of course wait till you get home after class so yeah i got home and the first thing i walked in kit was playing Fortnite, and i went and i I shaved the soul patch right away i was like that's not gonna it's not gonna happen i'm very disappointed i thought it looked quite creepy yeah (laughs) it just looked creepy and that's what i liked about it i was like you know what sam good for you to you know, walk down the street and be like, "This soul patch, this doesn't make me look weird at all." You know, you kind of had the confidence, and I was like, "It does make you look weird." Yeah, but I well, like that you were oblivious to it at the moment, well, and then thank, you became too self-aware. Yeah, thanks for showing your true colors, man. Yeah, of course. I also have to say, anybody thinking of coming on the show as a guest, absolutely should. You guys put me up in the best Motel Six. I mean, other mm-hmm. than ten channels mm-hmm. with commercials, it sometimes has warm water. Yeah. And I was like, no way. I was like, how'd you guys know that sometimes I'm going to get warm water? Yeah. I was really impressed. It's nice. It's kind of like a surprise, right? Yeah. You wake up, you're like, well, I could go for, I mean, I guess I could do a cold shower. It looks like I doesn't, I don't, I don't have a, cho- oh, oh, wait. Oh, no, it's kind of lukewarm. Oh, right. okay. Oh, no, it's exactly. cold again. And then you kind of switch, but it keeps you on your toes. Yeah. And that's good, you know, and as an improviser, I guess you kind of were thinking it's good for him to improvise with the temperatures. Absolutely. Which is nice. And, you know, it, the bed made me a little bit itchy, but again, keep me on my toes. Yeah. Right? It's I was very good. Yeah. You don't have that many spots on you from, from the bed, it seems. Surprisingly not. Too many not. Bites. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for cooperating. I know it was, like I said, short short, uh, short turnaround. Yeah, everyone else said no. Yeah. So I'm very glad I could be here. Exactly. Yeah. So you also did um, stand-up at 16 years old. 16 That's, to 18, yeah. 16 to 18. That is, dude, I get scared of, like, I've always thought about doing stand-up. I get scared of thinking about doing stand-up now as, like, a 24-year-old. I'm like, oh, man, like, I know I should just go and just do it. But still, there's that, like, worry of, like, bombing on stage. Like, what was it like for you as a 16-year-old to get up there and do it? You know what? I wasn't that nervous the first time. Um, I kind of got thrown into it. I had been talking. I was like, oh, eventually, I want to do stand-up. Like, eventually, that was my goal. And then my buddy was a barber and was giving me a haircut. And one of the other barbers was like, hey, I hear you want to do stand-up. I do stand-up. I got a spot on Tuesday. It's by your house. Like, come do it. Wait, so the, other, the other barber knew where you, where you lived? Yes. Okay. Yes, I got doxxed, actually. Okay, okay, so, okay. yeah, he knew exactly where I lived, lived in my area, and was like, come do it. Okay. So I did it, kind of no hesitation, wrote my material in about a week, and I didn't bomb. And so I was kind of like, oh, maybe there's something to this. And then right away, I just, I, I didn't get nervous. And I thought as long as I was confident, yeah. then I'd be good. And I think that's where my improv skills come from, was I love crowd work. That was always something that was really fun. Uh, but it was a little bit depressing. I think that's kind of why I switched into film. I mean, could you imagine being in a dive bar with four people and you're like 16 years old, never even been to a bar period. Yeah. True. And I'm in front of like four people. Yeah. Uh, and you got, I got heckled a little bit when I was young. People like, aren't you a little too young to be here? And I was like, bro, you're alone drinking a happy hour PBR. Yeah. It's Wednesday. At this dive bar. Yeah. Like you want to judge my life? Like yeah. I know I have a problem, but you know, so do you. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and then I ended up getting paid for it and I got to do some club shows and it was a lot of fun at the time. I mean, I had some good jokes, but it was really the crowd work that was fun. And then COVID kind of came around. Online shows weren't fun. And then it kind of pivoted to outside. And then I was like, hey, this is getting really depressing. And then you start to see, like I did a show in Hamilton, and it looked like I could start to go on the road with some comedians. And I was like, I can't do this. I'd really? be so alone. Like, there's no real commodity. Like, imagine I'm just in a hotel room alone right traveling alone and i was like there's got to be more than and comedians don't really support each other as much like if a 16 year old is doing a spot at a show that you wanted you're gonna think why is he getting it over me okay yeah true right and so there was never like that sort of commodity and my love always actually came from comedy movies i realized when i was young i snuck in in 2016 i snuck into every radar comedy in theaters i could see 
you name it, I saw it. The Nice Guys, which had so many boobies in it, and it was awesome. <laughs> I remember my buddy and I used to look at like the IMDb parent advisory, and if there was nudity, we're like, we're going to this. And we went to see the movie Pop Star, and it was just one penis. And we were like, that was the nudity? That was it. It was very disappointing. <laughs> and I used to like hide my iPad under my bed and watch rated R comedies. And that was where, I, and then I was like, no one's doing comedy movies anymore. I'm like, what happened to this genre? Like, it was just gone. Yeah. And now we were just talking outside. There's, you know, the new movie Bottoms is like one of the only ones that's come yeah. out recently that's actually funny. I really, really enjoyed that movie. Yeah. Yeah, that was hilarious. I mean, a lot of them now, I actually, bit of an embarrassing story. I'm a big TIFF guy. I love going to TIFF. That's not embarrassing. I worked at TIFF well, this past year. No, right? that's not the embarrassing oh, part. Okay. The embarrassing part was I, between classes, I was like, I'll go see a movie. I just had a bunch of time. There's a movie called Fitting In. I didn't look up what it was about. Okay. I was like, this is a, you know, coming of age comedy. I was like, this is great. So I rushed, yeah. which means like I waited in line yeah. for an hour. Yeah. Got a ticket by myself, sat in the theater. The movie starts. It's about a woman who doesn't have a full vaginal canal. Yeah. And here I am. As a dude sitting alone in a theater full of women watching a movie about a girl's vagina. And I'm thinking everybody here thinks I'm a creep. Like 100%. They're talking about how to dilate a vagina. Yeah, I'm just yeah, sitting there yeah. like, oh my goodness. When the lights come up, I'm going to look so bad. Put your hood on. Yeah. And I was just by myself too. Like kind of no excuse. And I couldn't imagine what the people were thinking when I was rushing, waiting an hour to see this movie. They're probably thinking like, he really wants to see this. <laughs> this guy really wants yeah. to see this What's movie. What's wrong with this dude? I, like, I don't know what I was thinking. I should have looked and fitting in. I should have put two and two together. But oh, I actually man. quite enjoyed it otherwise. I think it had some good messages in it. Yeah, absolutely. Which yeah. was nice. Like I didn't know how many men are gynecologists. Oh, it looks like too many. <laughs> A lot. It's, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which... You know, not that I'm going to switch professions now, but <laughs> you're going to go back to you're going to go to med school now. No, yeah. I could not go to med this school. one movie inspired me to yeah. be a gynecologist. I, the movie was OK, but being a gynecologist, I mean, such a man's profession. It. Yeah, you know? such a manly you know, profession to do. This is what I thought we'd be talking about. More of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, see, I, I don't know. Comedy was always something that I loved. And then I guess later on, I kind of realized in school that it didn't click to me until like grade 10 where I was like, oh, I really enjoy doing this. Yeah. But then my mom kind of put the dots together that I kind of always was a loud mouth in class. Apparently in grade two, my parents took me to Vegas just because like we just went to Vegas apparently, to hang like out. You don't remember? Like, no, we did. I think it was oh. grade two. And apparently I came back and told my teacher, I was like, how was Vegas? And I was like, it was great, but all my mom did was drink martinis and gamble. <laughs> And my mom told me, she was like, first of all, I've never had a martini in my life. And second of all, I didn't gamble at all. I was with you guys. Yeah. And so I was thinking, what kind of meta child would I have to be to be in grade two? Like, it would be so funny if yeah. I lied to my teacher that my mom's an alcoholic yeah. gambling addict. Oh, man. Dude, you did the whole opposite of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I know. You're I like, didn't even know the rule. Oh, teacher, let me tell you this day. And then we did yeah. all this and then this and this and that and then this and then gambling. And then yeah. strip club and, you know, yeah. and started going, oh, 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 this young child. And yeah. So I guess I was always like that. My grade five teacher used to like draw a line for me and like cross it and be like, this is what you're doing. You're crossing the line. Because I also, there's a, the nicest kid, I was in a gifted program. So every kid was really nice. Yeah. And there's this one kid, nicest dude ever. I have to say this because I'm the bad guy in this story. would have pencil shavings on his desk one time. And I was like, oh my God, like this guy's doing hash. First of all, how a grade four me knew what hash was, I still don't know to this day. Yeah. Like it makes no sense to me. And then this poor guy, and everyone was like, oh, oh, he does hash. He does hash. None of us really knowing what hash was. And I was just spreading this rumor in grade four. Yeah. What a horrible kid I was. Like, that's terrible. But that's like, that's peak like elementary stuff. Like, I remember in grade, I remember in grade four, it used to be, or back then, it, people would come up to me and be like, like, are you a virgin? And at the, I'm like, I don't know what a virgin is. I'd be like, no. They'd be like, ha ha, he's not a virgin. You know what I mean? Like, it was those kinds of yeah. jokes. I thought it's the opposite then, though. It's more of, it's bad that you weren't a yeah. virgin. They're making fun of you for not being a virgin. Yeah. What a loser. Yeah. Oh, what man. What a guy. Yeah. Now you would kill for that. Yeah, I also spread a rumor yeah. that a guy in my class loved Red Tube. Oh, God, really? Yeah. Was this still in grade four? This was grade five, I think. I think I had moved on from the hash to oh, red tube. Wow, but the fact that you knew that, like, even that is a little... I know, that's pretty something. dicey. But this Good is what Lord. happens when you grow up with unrestricted internet access, and I'm going, you know, to watch all these comedies. Fair enough. Do you have older siblings? Yeah, I got one who's in the program as well. Yeah. Same as me. He's more into music, though. But it was, wasn't, like, he wasn't any sort of, like, influence in all that? Uh... 
I would say no. We were into different things. He's gay, so we kind okay. of had different uh, interests at the time. Like, I think... I hear you, loud and clear. You know, he would watch, like, Monster High, and then I was online watching, you know, all those random movies. Yeah. It's like, what has the most boobies? In yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> what yeah, can yeah. I watch that has all the boobies? Right. Right? So, But he's very funny. He's actually funnier than I am. Uh, so I can, I think I was always trying to keep up with him Yeah. and his jokes. Like he was always making my family laugh and I was like, man, maybe he can do it. Like, obviously I can do it. We write that down. What did he say? Right. What? what oh, I'm taking that to school tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. It wasn't him that wrote it. So I think he was my first ghost writer. Did he, jokes. did like, did he help you write anything? Like, would you ever cast him in something? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. If he was into it, I think a hundred percent, he would be a great character. He'd be a great villain just because he's my brother. I'd want my brothers to play villains so they can be terrible people. Oh, okay. like, Look at my siblings. I'm the good one. Yeah. You know, as the middle <laughs> child, I was always getting blamed for everything. So now I can kind of pass the blame off. Are you the middle I child? Am, I am the middle child. Okay. Yeah. So. Is the middle child, is the rumor true where like the middle child is the, um, like the bad one? Yeah. Well, I, I think for me, the way it was, was it was always my older brother he's he's too mature to be doing that and the young ones he's oh, too yeah. young to be doing that so it has to be you yeah right like has to be me in the middle like what yeah. how is it me even though it probably was me a lot of the time oh fair enough so you're trying to you're trying to shift the blame but in the end it it was you so it, i'm trying to fix my microphone this is damn i like the squeak yeah i dude i have to like almost turn off the mic when i move it kit does it look okay in the camera yeah it's funny it's he Kit is very, he, like, last week leaving, he was like, oh, man, I love the cameras, and I had this up, and there was this <laughs> angle, and I, I tried playing with this, and I always tell Kit, I'm like, dude, you're you're welcome to to say something, like, if you have any questions, just chime on in, dude, don't be shy. I know, I was gonna say, Kit, I haven't heard much from you, and I haven't been able to tell you to pull anything up yet. I can't be like, Kit, pull that up, you know, pull that up. I'm on clock, Kirby. Kirby. This isn't a joke to me. This is work, all right? <laughs> this is my profession, actually. You, you know it's not a joke because when he's talking, he doesn't put the camera on himself. Really? Not at all? I don't think so. Is there any that's set up for you? There's none that's set up for me right now. He's just a voice. Dang, he's our voice of God. Yeah. At this point, he's going to give us all the information. You know what I thought the show was called Bird Core? I almost prepared a bunch of bird facts so I could like, keep up, and then I realized you guys don't talk about birds. No. Nope. Like, nope. not at all. It's because it's my name. Which then I, I later realized, I was like, oh, that's it. Yeah. He's just not into birds. No. But that's, that's you're not the first person who said that. Probably not. I'm not very original. So <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I would say you're original. I saw your movie. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I gave, for context, I gave you guys an advanced screening. Should be coming out next month. Yeah, release you. date coming out soon. Um, and you said that you somewhat liked it. That was the response. I, whoa, whoa. I never said somewhat. I, I very I much enjoyed it. it. Oh, see, I'm very happy to I, hear that. Dude, for, for when did you write that? Uh, 18. I made that when I was 18. You wrote that when you were 18 years old. Yeah. Throughout the last two years, I'm sure you went through a lot of the pre-production phases. You went into the production phases. Mm -hmm. You did the work of getting a whole team to not only shoot it, but edit it. You got, you had someone work on casting. You had all the extras. You did, f like in the credits, you have full-blown, like, little drawings that are related to the movie. Like, the effort is very, very much there. Oh, yeah. I mean, the first thing that we said, my team and I, when we started doing it, was we're not just going to make, like, a student film. Like, this is going to be so legit because my interest is, let's be honest, okay? When was the last time you guys... We're, you know, getting ready for bed or whatever. And you're like, I, I'm going to watch a short film tonight. I'm very excited to watch a short. If you do, then I just sound like a terrible person right now. <laughs> but my interest was always in making a feature film. So I was like, if we do something that is so high quality and at such a high level, maybe someone will let me do that. You're right. Right. Or maybe right. we can find a way to do that. So that was always our mindset was this has to look as Hollywood as possible. And a lot of that, I mean, I can't take credit for a lot of that. I mean, shout out. I know he's listening. My editor, Dante, also casted the movie. Dante. You know, brilliant man. And just, I remember I was talking to people in my program and or any other filmmakers, and they're always like, just so you know, no one's ever going to care about your movie as much as you. And I found that to never be true at all. I think people take such an interest to it. And it becomes, if you work as a team, it becomes a team. I mean, you hire people for their opinions. Yeah. You know, let them do that work. And by trusting people, I think, you know, I get there. I knew it was my first movie, so you're hiring people to do their thing, and I can learn off them. Like hiring an art department, I learned so much mm -hmm. to how you guys were talking before. Like it just, the movie looked so good, and the lighting is brilliant. Like it was very well done, but the art as well, like production design, really takes it to another level as well. And so we were just always finding ways to bring it to that that next level and 
the extras, I'll be honest, I mean, my lead actor, uh, popular in high school. So he just got a bunch of people who were like, oh, come on out. And it kind of worked out. Yeah. And so that was a guy who played uh, Leo? Yeah, Leo. Okay, so nice. shout out Luke. Shout out Luke yeah. DeFranco. Great guy. Not really. No, but, but not sorry. really a great guy? Or not really shout out Luke DeFranco? No, not really shout him out. I don't think he deserves a shout out. Okay. But we love him. We take so, it back, Luke. Yeah, Luke, sorry. Yeah. Not really shouting you out. But yeah, that was just a great process. And to do it over a year, like we edited for so long. Guys would come over to my house at nine in the morning and we'd edit till two in the morning. Wow. And then they'd go home, rinse and repeat. Yeah. Like we literally lived with each other. The amount of farts that I smelled from those guys is insane. Like I should not be able to smell a fart and go, oh. That was Dante. Yeah. Like, that just smells like his fart. So yeah. potent. That's too, mu- that's too much time together. Yeah. Exactly. Way too much time together. Yeah. But, yeah, putting together a movie was honestly just such an experience. And getting to premiere it in front of friends and family and anybody that wants to see it, it was awesome. It was yeah. a great experience. And so I'm very excited to hopefully make a feature next. Just need money. So if you're listening, give me money, please. If you want to produce Kirby's feature. <laughs> yeah, please. Please give me money. Yeah. I need money. Telefilm if you're listening. <laughs> Anybody CMF? Yeah. Anything? Please help me out. That's the hardest part of it, man, is like looking online and looking at all these grants and these different applying for funding and, okay, but if you want 200000 you need to meet this, this, and this. Yeah. Oh, if you want 225000 you need to also meet this, this, and this. It's a lot. It's um, It's pretty cuckoo bananas. Yeah. And a lot of the time, like, as well, like, I think it's telefilm is like your production company has to be incorporated to get the feature film. And I was like, okay, I can incorporate it. And then I learned that, like, when I incorporate my production company, even if I don't use it, I have to pay taxes on it forever. Yeah. So I was like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. And so what we've done is with the premiere tickets we sold, we've used that to buy our own equipment, our own cinema camera. And so hopefully we can make stuff at, you know, our own hands and not have to give away control yet. Yeah. Especially with comedy, if you know, I want to be able to do something like the old comedies, you don't want too many people being like, you got to change this joke. Man. I mean, yeah. look how we opened the show. I started talking about my butt sweat right yeah. away. I think, you know, a producer would be like, you can't say that, you know, or, or yeah. anything. Yeah. Well, that's why a lot of them, like, well, when you, like, bring a script to a production company, they'll have, like, their whole team of readers, like, look over it and be like, okay, maybe we're going to change this or... Uh, maybe have them rework that. And I've noticed that working for uh, a company that is like heavily involved in film is people will bring us these scripts and then a lot of the time if they want us to produce something, we'll kind of have our say at the script. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess that's why it's tricky for comedy when it's something that is so much your idea, you don't want someone else to change it all that much. I'm I'm sure that's that's for every genre. Um, And I think that's part of what's difficult about actually making it like taking that next step in, in in the industry is when you give your work to somebody they give their feedback and then you can be on the same page about it as opposed to like it's a versus b you got to come to c you know yeah. what i mean well that's the biggest fear in going into features with short films you're never making your money back you're not gonna make any money so it's not that big of a deal versus if you go to feature there's a lot of money involved right and there's an opportunity to make money so I actually understand why a production company would want to make changes. Yeah. Because there is legitimate money at stake. And if yeah. they're giving me money and they want to make money off of it, so I can understand. But that's the difficult part is now it's like, okay, how do I, you know, do both? How do I satisfy a production company while also, you know, satisfying myself? And so that's why I think the first draft is the most important, at least understanding character. Mm-hmm. And then you can kind of find your way through there. But if anybody's listening, again, I'm, I'll make any changes you want. Just give me the money at this point. Yeah. Well, we have about 3 million listeners, I think. Per wow. Episode. Yeah, 3 million. It's probably jumped to like four by this week. By this week I'm not surprised. Week. I think we'd get five if Kit would talk more. I'm telling you. Yeah, That's Kit's, the missing piece. Kit, say, just say one thing. Kit, what did you think of the movie, actually? Yeah. I know you saw it. I thought the movie was really good, really funny, refreshing, uh, especially because comedy movies are really dry now. And I thought the acting was really, really well. That's an awesome comment. I love my actors. So shout out to my actors. Also, another reason I'm taking improv. I want to meet more actors like yourself, you know, be able to expand that horizon and go into it. Yeah, I mean, I just... I hope comedy can come back. Like, I just hope Bottoms was a great example of you can still do comedy Mm -hmm. today and and make it. And that's why I just think it, ha- it might be indie is the way to go. I think right? so, like, yeah. It, it would be tough to have a studio approve a comedy now just because of the culture. But I love indie film. I mean, to me, I was always like, it'd be so hard to make a movie. And now you realize how easy it is. Like, I don't know if you know the movie Tangerine was shot all on iPhones. Like, it's just so easy now. Tangerine. You're smart. It's about prostitutes in L.A. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> don't ask why I know about it, but I just thought it was so cool. Well, I mean, given what you were saying before, <laughs> it sounds exactly like the kind of thing you'd be watching. What has all the boobies? <laughs> does it, have, does it have breasts? I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Talking about this movie, I haven't seen. But you look at indie films, like you look at, dude, like look at A24 and what they've done with the indie film mm-hmm. landscape. It's they're bringing all all sorts of different unique stories to the forefront, and compare it to. I feel like I've heard a lot of people say a big studio is like Marvel is kind of on the decline a little bit. Um, so indie film definitely, and with all these film festivals, yeah, like. I didn't realize how big TIFF really is until I was in the middle of it. And I was like, wow, this is actually an incredible opportunity for yeah. these young aspiring filmmakers or experienced filmmakers to showcase more of their work and their ideas. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it's, it's really like the last like few months I'd say is when I really, really got, more educated i'd say on on the film industry and more curious not just like oh i really want to work it there mm-hmm. one day but man like i want to know more i'm just i have so many questions there's so much that i want to learn and going back to what you were saying about working with people who like you were telling me yesterday your dop like you learned so much from your dop just based off like oh the light should reflect off of there and, yeah and the stuff that you wouldn't even think of no, never. It takes such a like specific mind yeah. for them to like walk in. And I'm like, okay, I'm thinking of this camera movement, yeah. and he can just go, great. Okay, so that means we need the light here, here, yeah. here, here, yeah. and here. And I'm standing there going, how like how do you know that? Yeah. But in the same way that I enjoy directing, in the sense of it's a puzzle in terms of your coverage, right? How do you get the best out of this scene? And in comedy, it's hard because how can you capture the joke? the yeah. best in yeah. this moment and that's the most I learned from the short film. Is now I know the style I like. Yeah. And to advance it because I've. I've always had a problem with how comedy movies are directed because I think a lot of the time they don't get the same care that other ones do in terms of how they're carefully crafted. A lot of the time they're shot with multiple cameras. They'll have one camera in a wide, and then it's like, okay, we got a camera picking up this solo shot, this Mm -hmm. shot here, and it just is clearly all multi-camera, and it's not as purposeful versus you watch a movie like Seven and the composition, the way it's crafted, it makes you a like gives you a feeling on purpose. And so I think that that's really interesting in the sense of like if I want to do – I want to do something that's like a satire at one point, but I want to shoot it super dramatically. But everything that's going on is jokes, but the whole composition is creepy, and it's actually properly insanely lit, insanely dark. But everything that's going on is silly. Like, American Vandal on Netflix is one of those things that blew my mind, where I was like, you can make a whole movie about spray-painting penises, (laughs) right, as a docu-series. Yeah. But it's so intense. Like, a Netflix doc, like, everyone wants to know who did this, and this guy's trying to clear his name, and I loved that. I was like, I don't know why comedy movies aren't directed like that more. Yeah. Did Jimmy Tatro write that? I, he was in that, he wasn't was in, he? Yeah, he was in the first season. It's, the one with... Oh, is it a... Oh, sorry, I haven't seen it. Is it a oh, series? Yeah, they did two seasons. So the second one, a guy puts laxatives in the school and everyone, like, poos their pants oh, no, for maybe a full I, day. I think I, I know about that one, yeah. Yeah, and so it's awesome. And I lo- and then it got canceled, obviously, but um, yeah, it was hilarious. And so that kind of changed my mind about, you know, how comedy can be done. And I really started to put two and two together. I think that The Hangover is my favorite movie of all time. And if you watch it, it's not shot with multiple cameras. And it's one comedy I can legitimately say is carefully crafted in their shots. They have beautiful shots, but shots that actually, you know, mean something. Mm-hmm. And they're, it's really beautiful. And I think that's been a huge influence on how I did. I mean, we we're talking outside about Bake Sale. Yeah. It's not, like, really bright. It's not, uh, you know, you could say the comedy is mostly lit pretty basically. Right? Like, it's just sort of yeah. as long as we see their faces, yeah. you know. A lot of bright lights and rooms, yeah. Uh, and it's not. I, we kind of gave a style to it. Yeah, there the was frat is really colors dungeon. all over. Yeah, and yeah. it's a lot of different colors. Yeah. So that was, you know, my intention going into it, and now I've learned so much since then, and hopefully get to change that over time. And your plan, in order to change that over time, is you you're using your film Bake Sale as a proof of concept. Yeah. Of like, look what I can do. Give me all your money. Yep. And let me make something that's an hour and a half like this. Exactly. Right. And being able to also. Like I, I was telling you, I think my writing has got a lot better. So now I can yeah. show, okay, here's what I, you know, did when I was 18 and can do. Yeah. Now you see this script. This script is a lot funnier. So now imagine what I can do. Yeah. If you give, if you give me money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you, if you give me money, I can do something a lot better. What is your writing process like? Do you, are you like a, do you develop the characters first? Do you have your idea of a story first? Do you just kind of start writing a beat sheet? Like what is your, how does it start? 
I don't like a beat sheet. At first, when I was learning writing, you know, beat sheet was very important. It's like you got to outline. Yeah. Um, but now I like to come up with my story first, and then I kind of find characters that can work in the sort of world I intend to build. And what's great about the feature I've been writing is I've had so much time to think about it that I don't have to just sit down and, you know, force myself to come up with ideas as I'm naturally building ideas through time. And then you can slowly inject them into a story. And now what I find is to discover a character, you know, you can sit there and kind of write out a scene. But I typically try and write about three pages longer than the scene should be just so I can have the characters ramble. The more I'm talking as the characters, the more I can understand, you know, what they really are like and what this scene really is. If I'm just having them ramble with each other, I'm like, okay, this is making sense to me now. This is the scene. And you kind of pick your in and out in that scene. So if I'm doing a minute scene and then I have five pages, which is like five minutes, I can find the in and out. What is funny about this scene? Mm -hmm. And what's the moment? And now I've found that character is the most important for comedy is finding characters Absolutely. that are like hilarious. Yeah. And then you can kind of build the world around that. Yeah. Which has been a lot of fun. And the problem with writing, though, is it's tough. But you need a lot of alone time, right? And so sitting in a room, you can drive yourself crazy. Uh, we just got to find ways to enjoy it. And that's why I kind of just enjoyed having characters talk in my head. And I'm just, you could imagine how mad I seem just sitting in a room, dead quiet, and I'll just go, eh. <laughs> <laughs> just right away, I'm like, that's funny. Yeah. And I can't turn it and be like, is this funny? It's more just like, eh, that's yeah. funny. Well, you can, you can ask yourself, you can ask one of your characters internally if it's funny. And then the character from the other side of your brain can answer you. Most of my characters just tell me to shut up. True. Like, what do you think? And they'll be like, no. Yeah. I'm like, okay little man and i hope they don't stick around and i just have voices now talking in my head yeah all the that time. would be like, a psychological issue at that point so you're saying i should get checked out then because uh, i do yeah if it occurs they don't more. stop talking yeah. one of them is telling me to just launch myself across the table at you right now really i'm saying don't do it well you have 10 minutes you can do it before we only got 10 minutes dude yeah we have nine and a half minutes left this stuff goes by fast i say it's cray cray must have been rambling a lot i apologize well it's okay you were saying rambling is how you get things <laughs> done rambling is how you perfect it so well i mean that's also what i'm learning in improv yeah you notice is when when we've been working a lot on creating characters it's just rambling you absolutely kind of find your character through there i mean what's what's your process like because i know you write as well you act as well what what's yours like in terms of writing and, and finding character um i the i've really only written one serious uh script um and in terms of that it was very much it was through beat sheet like we had, we already had our tagline. We had, we knew what the story was. Like we had the log line. It was all there. And then it was about setting up the, the episode. It was, um, and I wrote it with Kit and we kind of split the work. Kit, Kit is very much, he writes on his own. He knows how he wants his characters to speak to each other. He knows the tone he wants to give them, but he needs to write that on his own. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for him to do that as opposed to have me there being like, what well, they said this, what well, they said that. Kit, like, that's how he works. I I also noticed that my strength lies there. Um, while we were doing the majority of the writing, we were in a group, but I was just kind of locked in and doing, I was writing my, like I knew what I wanted to say and I didn't want to hear the everybody else's input. I was like, no, this is how I see this. Um, but I'm very character driven first, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote like another outline for another project I want to do later down the line. And I wrote out the characters first. I established, okay, this is the story, A, B, and C, and these are the characters that are in it. And this character is like this. This character is like this. That character is like that. This character is like this, but isn't in every episode. So it's kind of all over the place. Um, in terms of writing like shorter stuff, like I do a few like sketches and that is a lot less scripted. That's kind of just, you know, that's, that's more improv. improvised. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like some of the stuff I'll post on my own Instagram or my TikTok that's like much lower production, like lower production value is just stuff where I have this idea for a TikTok. I'm like, okay, I'll record this character saying this and then, okay, I'm recording this character saying that. That's really just kind of off the dome which there's so much magic in that and that's what i found directing was telling the actors listen like i know that you have this script that you've been memorizing in my lines but have fun with it like mm -hmm. you have to sort of especially in comedy they have to have a moment where you can just sort of like snap into it you realize the character and sometimes that's the magic and what you're doing is it's sort of like here's the idea now let's just have fun with it like yeah. let's figure it out yeah what is it exactly and th that's what makes people such good actors i think is like knowing to not be confined into well this is what the script says this is how, what i have to say if you can understand what the character is going to be like 
and you know the character. Well, maybe the character would also say this. Try it out. And I'm sure that there were lines, improvised lines in in your film. I'm sure that some of the actors were just like, oh, I'm also going to add this in there. And it worked. Yeah. You know I what mean, I mean? Like, There's a time in the, the movie, I won't say when, but two of the characters kiss. And that was sort of improvised. <laughs> that part made but me laugh. What the actors didn't realize, he was like, what if I just kiss him? And I was yeah. like, that's great. Do it. And then I'm like, afterwards, I'm like, just so you know, obviously this is film. So you don't have to do that about four more times. Right? Oh. Like we're in your And he's like, oh, I don't just like kiss yeah. him and finish. I'm like, no, you're basically going to be like making out with him now yeah so we're gonna do it three more times oh. and i think the kissing just got better and better and then at the end i was like so are you guys together now yeah or like <laughs> how do you not fall in love with each other at one point kid asked that he's like are they dating right <laughs> like you just see them sort of fall in love all of yeah. a sudden and that's yeah. what people forget about you know the film versus tv is once yeah. you commit to an idea you now got to do it four or five more times yeah yeah that's how it works right and i mean film is also tough because you don't have a lot of time at the beginning of the movie uh, I'll just say there's like a, a peeing scene and we we're trying to figure out logistically how to do that Yeah, and so the actor had a Gatorade bottle in his pants to start and it just wasn't working well We couldn't get the camera in you could sort of see it and in our AD was so quick He was like, you know, we got to be on time on time always, you know, kind of tell me things And so we're like, okay, we got to switch the bottle like we're gonna get a plastic bag cut it He can squeeze it out of that so the actor takes it out of his pants and the AD's like, give it to me. Like, we got to switch. And he's like, just so you know, like, this has been all over my shaft, mm. balls, everything. Yes, and the AD genitals. just goes, there's no time. And like grabs it out of his hand. Damn. And just like walks out of the room. And the actor's saying, they're like, yeah, uh, fair enough. Like, I guess not. Yeah. Which, again, just magic of, I'm just sort of saying, they're like, okay, I guess we're rolling now. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Did someone check on that AD? Did he wash his hands? I have no idea. I don't know what else he touched yeah. after that. Uh, but you know, out of sight, out of mind. Wow. Don't really need to know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It probably keeps you up at night sometimes though. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah sometimes. I mean, we were in a frat house, so everything was gross. Yeah. Everything was hot. And you shot that over three days, right? Yeah. Very condensed. It looked so, I was like, did they shoot this all in one night? Cause it just looked that way. Yeah. Luckily. I mean, that was a big thing in terms of budget where I was like, this has to take place not only in one place, but one night. So then we don't have to you know, yeah. change clothes or have to worry about shooting out of order. We're going to have to shoot at different times in the day. And it was always just, okay, we can just black out the house. It's at night. Yeah. And the lighting doesn't change. And then obviously we just shot the outdoor stuff actually at night. Yeah, and that allowed us to shoot throughout the day. Um, but that's the other thing, especially when shooting indie film, is you have to think budgetary as yeah. you write. But I find there's so much magic in that. I mean, you were saying earlier with Marvel movies, my problem with film now is not that there's Marvel movies or anything. There's not enough stories about real people. Like, actual people doing everyday things. There's so much humor in that. Yeah. And just, like, everyday activities. And now we're not making those movies. Right? It's all, oh, everybody's a superhero. Or even comedies now are mostly action comedies. I'm like, you don't need yeah, the action. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right? Like, let's just do a regular comedy about some regular yeah. people in a weird situation. I want to see a comedy about an electrician who's late for his shift as a bartender and hits someone with a car. But there's humor in that, yeah. right? Like uh, Office Space is hilarious, and it's literally just about a guy silently quitting his job, like quiet yeah. quitting, yeah. which if I pitch that to you, you'd be like, yeah, you're going to put me to bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's humor in that and relatable humor as well. Why Seinfeld was successful or Curb Your Enthusiasm is one of my favorites just because there's so many things that every day that can annoy someone and yeah. you just don't say anything. And that's why the writing is so crucial. Yeah. That's why it has time. to be like... Writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and uh, you got to cut out a joke that you're in love with. You know what I mean? It's tough. Which hurts yeah. a lot of the time. It really yeah. does hurt when you're sitting and you're like, it has, it has, it to, has go. to go. Yeah. And you sort of lose that, especially in editing. That was the hardest part where there's so many moments we were trying to put in, and you just have to let go of something that's really good. Yeah. Sometimes and no one's ever gonna know. Yeah. Right. It's it's tough, but it's where the fun is. It's a lot of fun doing comedy, yeah. and I think it's a challenge finding it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But it just gets better and that's why i'm so happy now i feel like i found my voice in writing a Good. lot more and there's just so much magic to come it's just so magical yeah you know? just such a magical experience like it's like going to disney world every day <laughs> i love it wow and and you're young so you'll only get more experience and more only more depressed know, well yeah that's what you mean yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit too excited about what's to come yeah versus i'm actually gonna go try and make this feature and everyone's gonna be like no yeah well no you're gonna have a, you're gonna hear a lot of no's before you hear your or hear you one yes which is also the magic in it because yeah. then you just you know i think once someone says no i go i have something yeah right because yeah. if someone says yes right away you go why yeah that was a little too easy yeah do you that's like true. not yeah. care about yeah it? that's a good way to look at it 
right? It's almost like, are you desperate for something? Like, why aren't yes, you? Yes, yes, we'll no? take yeah. it. Yes. And then you're like, oh my goodness, why? <laughs> Let's it... start tomorrow. Yeah, and you're like, oh, okay. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> there's too many yeses, and then the no's yeah. will make you work harder as well in terms of rewrites. Like we had a cinematographer turn down doing the movie, and I was, and I was like, okay, well then, what if I just made it better? And now you're gonna feel like you're missing out. Yeah. Right, and you kind of have to have a negative mindset in that sense. I'm gonna prove you wrong. Yeah. Or you prove yourself right. Exactly. That too. Yeah. If you want to prove yourself right. If you're egotistical like you, me personally, yes. you know, I'm none of that. Yes. Right? Like Kid, I know it's a huge ego. I mean, just won't stop talking. It's ridiculous. The whole yeah. time. Yeah. It's honestly, it's gotten to the point where I might have to fire him. I know. I mean, for a producer, like you're supposed to really not say anything and Kit just rambles and rambles. Oh, yeah. the cameras. Yeah, he doesn't shut up. Yeah. Well, dude, we have about 45 seconds left. So, um, hey, thanks for having me on. Dude, thank you for. Uh, I'm so glad that we were peeing at the same time yesterday. That was awesome. What great timing. It was great. What great timing. Yeah. You had a great stream. Thank you, man. Of course. It was clear. It was not yellow. You know, I was hydrated. Level. Yeah, championship level yeah. P. I think my mother's listening to this right now. Oh, I'm so sorry, then. No, it's <laughs> I have okay. not said some great things. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's inspiring. All right. Well, Kirby Sloan, thank you for coming in, brother. We appreciate it. Um, I'll see you in improv class next week. I'll see you in about 15 seconds when we're out of the studio. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm still here. Yeah. All right, folks. This is uh, Sam Bird, Bird Core. We will see you next week on Spirit Live at 5 o'clock. Um... I I love you. I love you, Kirby. I love you. Oh, oh so cute. Okay. You look so cute right oh, now. Oh, come on. Look at you. Okay. And you too, kid. Okay. Okay. It's like a dream of mine to, to sure. completely blow out and like have to restructure my knee. We've communicated yeah. and said, you know what? Lion tastes good. Let's go get some more lion. Cindy! The TV's leaking! McLovin? Yeah. Today is Thomas Cup's birthday, and this is Project X. Yo.